Good morning and welcome to Our Issues Milwaukee. I'm your host, Andrea Williams. Our focus this morning is on politics. Tuesday, August 9th is primary election day in Wisconsin and offices on the ballot include U.S. Senator, U.S. Representative, all Wisconsin Assembly seats, the even-numbered Wisconsin State Senate seats, and all district attorneys. And my first guest was elected Milwaukee's top prosecutor in 2006. He previously served as a Milwaukee County Assistant District Attorney for 12 years, supervising the Firearms Enforcement Unit for most of that tenure. He was born in Milwaukee and raised in Waukesha County. He's a graduate of Marquette University High School, Marquette University, and earned a law degree from University of Wisconsin Law School. He's also served as an officer in the United States Army. It is a pleasure to welcome Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm to our Issues Milwaukee. How are you? I'm great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for taking the time out and being here today. And Milwaukee County has and continues to face unprecedented challenges on many different levels. Talk about some of your accomplishments that you are most proud of. Well, the first and most important one is that I've been committed to public service almost all my adult life. And what I derive the greatest value from is being able to serve this community. And so whether it was as an assistant DA working on reducing uh, the harmful impact of firearms violence in the community um, or taking it to the next level, which was actually trying to get to some of the root causes. And so we implemented a nationally recognized program called the Community Prosecution Program that actually puts experienced prosecutors in the community to work with the community mm -hmm. to identify and solve problems and actually build neighborhood cohesiveness so that we're not relying just on police and prosecutors and courts to solve all these problems. We actually want the community to be involved in the decision making on what's taking place in their neighborhoods and informing our decisions on how we address those problems. I'm also really excited about uh, uh, the efforts that we've made to address issues like family violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, the greatest example of that has been the Sojourner Family Peace Center um, that we took a lead role in, in developing and advocating for where the concept is that kids exposed to violence, families exposed to violence are more likely to either become victims or perpetrators of violence later on. And we want to address that up front with wrapping all the services we possibly can around that that family to make them safe and to keep us safe in the future. Mm -hmm. And stop that cycle. And of stopping violence. the cycles, yeah. it's absolutely critical. Well, you've said that public safety is the utmost importance of you to you, and you think it's safe to say that many people living in Milwaukee County are very concerned about uh, gun violence and the juvenile crime system at this point because we continue to see uh, young people, there are many of them are repeat offenders, and they are kind of slapped on the hand, they go back out on the streets and commit another crime, and this has drawn attention to uh, the system itself. Uh, you recently appeared before the Public Safety Committee. Give us your thoughts on these particular issues and uh, how you uh, hope to see some sort of reform. It's really important to have experience in bringing forth solutions. Mm -hmm. And I say that because with 22 years of experience in the criminal justice system, I can look back and I can look at previous periods in our time where we've encountered really similar significant concerns that have you know, just dramatically risen. For example, in the early 1990s, you went from about 70 homicides and then the crack epidemic took place and you saw the homicide rate go up to 170. Wow. And so in the space of a short time, the community had to react to that and prosecutors and police had to react to that. And um, one, of the, one of the directions we went then was um, to take a very uh, strict approach on, on drug crimes, for example. That had um, some benefits, but it also had some unintended negative consequences that is reflected in the high incarceration mm -hmm. rates, right? Mm -hmm. So I start by saying that because um, these are serious issues. They have to be addressed, but they have to be addressed thoughtfully. So uh, our experience is that a small number of people create a disproportionate amount of the harm and we have to do an effective job of identifying them early. And that's why you want uh, programs like the community policing and community prosecution. Mm -hmm. Build trust with the community so they help us identify those individuals so you're not uh, taking a broad spread approach to uh, enforcement in the community, but you're actually targeting on the people that are committing the, the most dangerous offenses. So that's what I've always concentrated on in my career. Now the reality is that we have to do uh, an effective job of identifying the people that are coming to us for drug 
drug addiction, mental illness, alcohol addiction, and do something different. They're generally lower risk people. You're, they're, they're not a risk to go and shoot somebody or mm -hmm. rob somebody, um, but we have a lot of those problems coming into the system. We want to have enough resources so that we can spend most of our court resources on the dangerous offenders. And again, I've, I've, um, I've always advocated, I've always pushed that. That's why I've dedicated uh, firearms enforcement unit, homicide unit, sensitive crimes unit, all of, you know, a dedicated domestic violence unit, all of which are doing trials. We have a 95% conviction rate for homicides. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes people don't know how much hard work is going on in the courtroom every day. But we also believe in trying to work with the community to solve those problems. With respect to the juveniles, serious problem, no question about mm -hmm. it. Um, and, and again, fact versus myth, uh, we tend to charge uh, a large number of the cases that are brought to us by the police. What happens afterwards, though, is a challenge for the system. You've seen what's happened up at Lincoln Hills. Yes. That's the ultimate sanction for yes. a juvenile. And if you can't send that juvenile to a safe location where they're actually gonna be rehabilitated, if you have a 60% recidivism rate out of Lincoln Hills, that tells you that that's a failed system. Mm -hmm. The problem is you need more options right at the community level. They have to be secure options. There's no question about it. I'm convinced that if we had more secure options in the community, the, the judges and all the actors in the system would be more willing to put the individuals in those secure settings because then they could still stay in touch with their families in the community and you could actually bring them back into the community at the appropriate time in a safe way. That's the direction we have to go in the future. Yeah, um, and a lot of people that we've had on the show and just uh, off the top of my head, uh, you've got Common Council President Ashanti Hamilton. He's talking along the same lines as absolutely. you. Uh, and then you've got uh, State Senator Lena Taylor all exactly. of these concepts of how to kind of fix this issue, everybody sounds like they're working towards uh, that same direction. So hopefully we can see something come of it. Absolutely, and you mentioned the public safety uh, committee hearings that, that mm -hmm. I attended. Um, that was at the invitation of uh, President Hamilton, mm -hmm. and, and it was a sincere invitation to um, allow them to learn more about the system. I think a lot of people were surprised about mm -hmm. um, some of the challenges that we face in the criminal justice system, in particular within my office. Um, but the other advantage that I have is that um, I've worked with all of those um, other individuals that have a deep concern for Milwaukee, and almost all of us, whether, whether it's law enforcement agencies or whether it's community-based organizations, other elected officials, anybody that's, that just fundamentally, fundamentally believes in the importance of public service, they're all uh, people that I've worked with. We shared 90% 90, 90 of a, a common vision for how we can keep a, a safer community. And, um, and that's again why it's important to have this level of experience and relationships with people in the community to try to get these things done. All right, so uh, what I definitely want to bring up, your office launched two secret John Doe probes against Governor Scott Walker's associates that netted six convictions. Uh, and the investigation into whether Walker's 2012 gubernatorial recall campaign illegal coordinated with outside conservative groups, uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court halted that last summer. Uh, why were those cases so important for you to investigate? So when I first ran back in 2006, mm -hmm. I promised the community that I'd do certain things. I'd do everything in my power to keep them safe, but I'd also address the issue of trying to reduce people in prison. Second thing I promise is that we'd hold ourselves accountable. Mm -hmm. And by ourselves, I meant public officials. And that means police officers, uh, that means lawyers, um, that means other elected officials. Um, that means that anybody that's in a position of trust, um, we have an obligation to make sure that they follow the rules and are held accountable. And if they don't do so, it is the obligation of the prosecutor to um, investigate and go where the evidence leads. It, it's not a partisan issue in any way, shape, or form. It's what's my obligation as uh, a, a uniquely elected official which ha who has the responsibility um, for following the law mm -hmm. and doing so in a principled and ethical way. Um, with the evidence that we obtained, we felt it was important those matters be investigated. Um, I obviously disagree with the decision to halt the investigation, mm -hmm. even though even though we had handed it over to a special prosecutor, and even though you know five other DAs, both Republicans and Democrats, had agreed that it should be simply investigated. So they stopped uh, the investigation and dramatically changed Wisconsin law. And for that reason, I believe it's an issue of importance at the state level 
um, but it's also a nationally important. So it's, it's currently before the United States Supreme Court, and uh, my hope is that they will examine the issue uh, related to disguised money and related to when a judge should uh, remove him or herself from a case if they have um, some potential conflict in the case. And those are the two issues that are before the Supreme Court right now. So it's now. safe to say to be continued. Oh, no question. <laughs> no question. And there are a couple of things that you've said uh, just at uh, this moment. Uh, a word that I think is going to be major for our entire society, uh, specifically in the upcoming months, uh, accountability. That's right. Because, um, Needless to say, uh, there's an array of emotions that surround shootings of black men that we've recently witnessed in Minnesota, Louisiana, and then there was a shooting of police by a gunman in Dallas, Texas. Um, what are your thoughts when it comes to these type of situations? Because I think uh, what we're not seeing in many cases is accountability, which leads people to not have that same uh, faith or trust in a system. Right. So. Um, first issue is uh, one of, again, it's a little bit of fact versus myth, and that is, um, as I indicated, I, I do the things I say I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And so I have held many, many police officers accountable for criminal offenses in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not afraid to prosecute police misconduct cases any more than I'm afraid to prosecute lawyers or elected officials. So, um, so I start off with that position. Now, as it relates to officer use of force cases, um, there's no question that that is now a national discussion. It's been a local discussion. Um, I've, I've always been committed to making sure that I am on scene um, with my own investigators and following up. Now, the law has changed recently um, requiring an independent agency to conduct the investigation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's a step forward, but um, at the end of the day, these are all tragic circumstances. It is absolutely tragic for the family of the survivor. It's tragic for the community who has a historical experience uh, with with unfair practices, mm -hmm. and and that is what that's the the uh, really deep emotions that run in in the community. But at the end of the day, um, and I always meet with the families, always meet with the families, and give them all the information I have. At the end of the day, I have to make a legal decision, and that's my obligation as a prosecutor again to make an ethical, principled decision on whether that case could be proven or not. And um, in the context of police officers, um, they're actually trained to certain standards, and uh, if they follow those standards in employing force, um, that's something that has to be considered mm -hmm. uh, when you're making a determination whether they acted properly or improperly. But there are always tragic circumstances, and I'm convinced that we can do better as, as, uh, as a community and certainly in law enforcement itself uh, to reduce the number of, of these incidents. A Absolutely. Lot of them, a lot of them, quite frankly, are related to uh, individuals suffering from mental illness. That's mm -hmm. why I've, I've pushed for and uh, recently received funding to uh, address the issue of the mentally ill in our system. We would ideally like to have an array of options that keep the mentally ill out of the criminal justice system, whether it's the jails or the prisons. And um, that's one approach that I'm taking to address that issue. But, but it's a significant issue um, that has to be addressed um, in collaboration with the entire community. Absolutely. These are tough discussions, believe me. They are. Um, and it's sometimes hard for people to fully understand the process. So you talk about uh, individuals who are living with mental illness who sometimes end up in the system, or in the case of Dontre Hamilton, which is still uh, sparking protests here in our community, uh, Dontre was shot by a then police officer, Christopher Manning, back in 2014. 14 times he was shot. Manning lost his job, but later appealed, and then you found that his use of force was justified self-defense. That's still a hard verdict for a lot of people to swallow. Um, your thoughts? Sure, two separate issues. The first issue, I actually made my determination first. So mm -hmm. my, mine is a, is a determination of whether criminal charges are brought. Mm -hmm. The decision to fire is an admit, administrative decision. Right. And so, and I certainly had my decision reviewed by the uh, federal system as well, and they concurred with that decision not to charge him criminally mm -hmm. uh, with, with uh, any acts. Um, that doesn't take away the, the tragedy that the family experiences or, or any of the serious issues that we have to deal with. But again, uh, on the narrow issue of when confronted with somebody with a deadly weapon, which in this case it was a, a baton that the officer had been disarmed with and the officer had been struck with that baton, it's a narrow issue of whether the officer under that 
precise moment has a sufficient basis to use deadly force. And that's, that's what I'm asked to look at, and that's, that's the decision that um, I had to make based on the law and the facts. But um, it certainly does not depreciate um, the, the, you know, a horrible circumstance that leaves the family and the concerns that the community has with it. The administrative decision taken by the police department was just that. They, they determined that the officer hadn't used the proper amount of judgment in that circumstances mm -hmm. that, that they thought was, was appropriate. Yeah, not an easy job. No, it's, it's no, not, it's but, not. It's, but it's a job that I, I love doing because I love this community I, and I know that I have an opportunity to make a difference as do the, the many incredible young people that uh, work in the office and support the office um, in terms of dealing with our victims. And that's, that's the, the thing that's often hidden is that our primary job um, is not always simply courtroom litigation. A lot of t the work we do is trying to, to heal the victims of crime mm -hmm. and to give them a sense of, of closure and being able to move forward. So a lot of our effort is spent focused on uh, dealing with the victims of crime as well. Yeah, and I've seen you uh, on video walking the streets of Milwaukee trying to get a feel for uh, what's going on, like you said, outside your office, outside the courtroom, uh, because that's what's needed. So I thank you for your time and coming by. All the best to you Andrew. in uh, running for re-election. And uh, again, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Incumbent Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm. And to find out more about the district attorney and where he stands on the issues, you can log on to johnchisholm.org. And don't forget to vote on Tuesday, August 9th. When we return to our Issues Milwaukee, we'll meet John Chisholm's opponent for Milwaukee County District Attorney. We'll talk with Attorney Verona Swanigan right after this.